If you've ever wanted to make the internet mad, sit back and watch this. Exotic Weapons in Destiny 2. For everyone who's played for more than six months, we have at least one or two that we take everywhere we go in PvP. They're very much a part of who we are, or what we choose to be as guardians in the world. Those weapons and the identities we carve out with them are a major factor in the way we approach the game. If you run an exotic in PvP, how you approach the game is framed around your chosen centerpiece, your preferred mantle of destruction. Unless that mantle is Graviton Lance, in which case you ain't destroying Jack. Choosing just one to take up a slot in your loadout isn't straightforward, no matter how inexperienced or hardened you are, myself included. So to find some clarity, I did the totally normal thing and sat down to rank every single non-power weapon exotic in the Crucible for Destiny 2. For those keeping count, that's 30 kinetic and 30 energy weapons. I took into account lethality, ease of use, their exotic functionality, and how they impact the way you play the game, as well as assessing whether or not they were even worth the exotic slot to begin with. For a gun to demand that exotic slot, it would have to be a very special weapon indeed. But as ever, this game is high on nuance and short on absolutes. It's never as simple as what the loudest person in your Discord server would have you believe. But I know I'm not just ranking weapons here. I'm ranking identities, preferences, and for some entire playstyles. This video will probably make a few of you angry, but try to remember that this video was made in the spirit of both of these. So if you've got a problem, take it up with him. Sit back and relax. Keep an open mind and an open heart, and let's get to it. My name is Ascendant Nomad, and I'm your Crucible Doctor. Today's video is brought to you by me. I'm doing a charity stream and I'd love for you to join me. Game to Give is the global annual charity event hosted by the Bungie Foundation and Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. Their goal is to raise money for various programs that aid with the support of at-risk children and adults at home and around the world. My stream will be live over at twitch.tv forward slash Ascended Nomad from 1pm to 3pm Eastern on December 9th. The goal is to raise $5,000 by the end of the stream. If you do decide to donate, depending on how much you give, you'll receive the rewards on screen now for doing so. If you've got anything to spare this holiday season, please consider stopping by the link in the video description below and donating to a good foundation with a good cause. Thank you for your time, and I hope to see you on stream on December 9th. Cheers. Right. Let's get some things out of the way. Straight away, some of the exotic rankings here will likely change based on how they perform post December 7th. That doesn't mean this video is invalid, it just means I have to make another one in the new year to address the changes. Lucky me. Secondly, builds, or namely, lack thereof. Builds and exotics go hand in hand, but they create a huge problem when it comes to evaluating them. There's so much potential in builds, so many different minutiae to cover, that were I to consider them, the video would have to be triple the length. So instead, I'm going to opt for an out-of-the-box experience to review for simplicity and fairness. That being said, full disclosure, all weapons were tested on a hunter using Dragon Shadow. I primarily play on PC with mouse and keyboard, but for certain weapons I plugged in my Xbox Elite Series 2 controller to note the differences. I am far worse in controller than MNK, but I can definitely hold my own on there thanks to my history of being a Destiny 1 player. Thirdly, all exotics tested had their catalyst unlocked and completed if they had one. Fourthly, we're not discussing heavy weapons in this video. To try and reasonably test this out would have been a nightmare to do. Not to mention, they're power weapons. They're all meant to be overpowered and hugely impactful. So it's more beneficial for me to talk about those that have the most uptime and aren't reliant on a power ammo box to be useful. And finally, let's talk about how I ranked everything. The criteria is as follows, from most important to least. First, overall lethality. This describes the exotic's ability to inflict meaningful damage, both optimally and suboptimally. It's tempting to just use the time to kill value, but that doesn't tell the full story. Most people hit body shots, and that's important to remember too. Second, exotic functionality. This metric evaluates how useful the unique perk or combination of perks ends up being for everyday combat in the Crucible. It's also an unmistakable part of the exotic, and sometimes what an exotic lacks in lethality, it can more than make up for it in additional functionality. Third, ease of use. 
any exotic you can pick up and slay out with is worth serious consideration. The lower the barrier to entry to feeling like the space magic slayer you are, the better. And fourth, the overall package strength. This looks at the entirety of the exotic as a whole and asks the question, is this worth the exotic slot? As with State of the Meta, we're going to be assessing everything with a not tier list approach, which involves loose categories and no clear definitions or ratings. This more nebulous conversational method allows for the discussion to contain more nuance because I truly believe that aside from just a few of the exotics we're gonna go over today, every single one is viable and useful in the right hands, but some are more viable than others. So let's begin with the bottom of the totem pole, the bad. These are the weapons I'd recommend playing with at least once just to see what's what. Some are actively terrible, some are very solid meme experiences. Either way, each one of them offer, shall we say, unique experiences that are worth the hour of laughs or cringe that they provide. Starting off, we have Sweet Business. This is by far and away one of the most fun exotics in the game you can run. You just spool up the big f***ing gun and unleash a hailstorm of bullets towards the poor sap that chooses to get in your way. It's pure silliness and fantasy, and I love it to bits. It's even better when you stack with six people on Iron Banner and move as a group. But individually, we know it's not that good. It only kills fast when spooled up, and you need to pre-fire to do so. And when you pre-fire, you make a hell of a lot of noise. Noise that's easily understood by everyone as a don't challenge this thing. Unless you have your own sweet business, in which case, begin pre-firing yourself and cue Duel of the Fates on Spotify. It pains me to do this to my favorite exotic from Destiny 1, but Jade Rabbit just isn't very good in Destiny 2. It's a high impact scout rifle whose exotic perk is a modified version of Headseeker. It's satisfying to use and probably the best feeling kinetic scout in the game, but we don't have the maps for it. Plus, nothing about this weapon, aside from the sound and the feel of it, makes it any better than its legendary counterparts. Hard pass. Same too for Wish Ender. Its wall hacks are an obvious plus, with it being nigh impossible to miss a shot once you get comfortable with using the bow. But you're stationary a lot of the time to make the best of it, which doesn't help your team in any way. The draw time of 0.8 seconds means to kill someone, you will need 1.6 seconds. That's not news for bows, but it doesn't feel good to use, wall hacks or not. There may be some utility in 3v3 game modes where knowing the position of the enemy is extremely necessary, but should that come at the cost of not being able to be mobile with your team? I personally do not think so. Bad Juju is a member of the neglected 450 RPM Pulse Rifle Club. It's a decent enough pulse with good amount of stability, solid recoil direction, okay-ish range, but the lethality just isn't there. Three bursts gives a time to kill of 0.87 seconds, but all shots need to be crits to make it viable. Its exotic functionality consists of a combination of subsistence, a form of rampage, and thresh, but it's very much tuned for PvE rather than PvP. I really struggled to make this one work with any consistency because I was getting outdueled a lot. It's just not very good. Yes, I know Fighting Lion has gotten a lot of its changes dialed back, but as of the making of this video, we've got a primary ammo void grenade launcher with the feel and handling of your mother after a McDonald's date. <laughs> the only viable way to make this gun work was to use it in combination with something else, a technique known as blinting, as you can see. It can't really kill on its own, and it's hard to get over how bad it feels right now. I hope that has changed since the patch. In theory, Graviton Lance is one of the coolest weapons in the game. The thing shoots black holes at people for God's sake. But I believe these black holes were made in a pillow factory because they hit about as hard. There's a weirdness to the way the gun handles as well, with the unique two burst shot kicking up immensely to the point where the hit reg feels off. I was told to aim for the chest and admittedly it did help, but not by much. A base time to kill of 1.0 seconds means this is one of the slowest killing weapons in the game. I didn't enjoy using this at all, and the perk Cosmology did nothing for me when I used it. Shame, really. Skyburner's Oath. Jesus Christ. It's a terrible scout rifle. Like, genuinely horrible. I did enjoy the novelty of how well it functions as a sidearm when hip firing, shutting down a few shotguns in my time with it. But dear god, was it terrible for everything else. Grinding for the catalyst was one of the worst things I've ever done with it. And for the performance it gave me in return, 
I sleep badly now, with the knowledge that I'll never get those three hours of my life back. Merciless. Words cannot describe how physically ill this gun made me. It takes forever to charge and frequently had bolts missing or flat out just refusing to register. Of waiting that time for the charge to go off to have bolts ghost into thin air was nauseating. But this is a generic problem with all high impact fusion rifles. Furthermore, its exotic perk just doesn't work at all in PvP, so it's a non-starter in my opinion. The Catalyst's boost to range and handling was a bright point in an otherwise bad experience, so let's hope the changes to fusion rifle projectile speed in the patch bumps this up a category for next time. I'm not sure where I can put Trinity Ghoul amongst this immediate company, but I do know that it's certainly underwhelming. As a bow, it certainly has strong sides, but I'm not sure if it's enough to warrant that exotic slot for PvP. The Chain Lightning is great for priming targets, but it doesn't boost the first shot's damage or do enough to clean up most of the time. It's a monster for momentum control, but not much else sadly. Ariana's Vow doesn't do anything a legendary 90 RPM sniper can't do. I genuinely do not see the point of this weapon in the Crucible for anything other than the notorious Bow Blint, which pairs the exotic with a kinetic precision bow, equipped with quick access sling. On its own, it provides no tangible use that you can't find elsewhere. Cool gun, great aesthetic, great performance to build around with a good starting mag size, but if you know the sandbox, this won't be your first pick. Now what happens when you give a shotgun zero range and give it the fire rate of an auto rifle? You get the fourth horseman. It's a fun weapon, but let's not kid ourselves. It's the worst shotgun in the game. For pure meme potential alone, it's worth running and having a laugh with, but pick this up and you'll immediately understand why seeing one in the Crucible is rarer than seeing Haley's Comet. And finally, Tiku's Divination. In the right place, at the right time, with the right person using it, Tiku's has the potential to really surprise an enemy team. But as I found in testing, those stars don't really align all that often. The functionality is certainly exotic, hipfire auto-tracking bows to prime the target and a follow-up headshot to make them go boom, but most of the time this only worked when players were unaware of being primed. Against smarter targets, they simply do not re you. And I'd rather a legendary bow instead for those moments, if I'm being honest. Look, bow mains, I respect the hell out of you, but there's only one of your exotics worth using. It's far too good for this next section though, so let's do that first and get through with what I feel are the exotics that are simply... Okay. For this section, I decided to highlight some of the more unconventional exotics here that still offer unique experiences, but their success rate really comes down to the player itself. I maintain that everything is viable in the right hands, and that's certainly true of these ones. But if you can dominate a lobby with these ones, well, you've got something special going on, my friend. So let's start with Cerberus plus one. Now, I promise, I'm not being held at gunpoint by Travel Danielle to say nice things about it. In fact, she's a wonderful human being and her straw banner flavor of advanced is the best out there and you should really go ahead and use code tr No, but seriously, this weapon has some serious stopping power. Now that pellet shotguns have been reined in, it's breathed new life into Cerberus's viability. The superior range to pellets makes it worth a shot alone, even if it's not that much better. The shots do pack a punch and with the right timing, close range shutdowns of supers are possible. It's by no means best in class and the focus fire mode is laughable to be polite, but it's unique and it's good fun all around. Huckleberry is one of those exotics I was ready to love. Every time I picked it up, it's always been fun to play with. The increased fire rate that comes with Ride the Bull is so satisfying when used correctly and when you get just one stack of Rampage, you feel unstoppable. But this gun is designed to never be reloaded, to continually chain kills with no end. And in PvP, that's just not a reality you face very often. You feel that 10 reload speed way too much, and it feels horrible. So, I can't place it in anything higher than just okay. Same goes with Malfeasance. Credit where it's due, this is a really nicely balanced 180 RPM hand cannon. I've been finding a new appreciation for them on PC where they're kind of considered a joke option, and the Malfeasance does feel rather good for what it is, mainly due to its high stability. The Explosive Shadow perk, which auto-deletes Guardians after 5 successful shots, is a lovely cherry on top if you've missed some crits. But getting to that stage is another thing entirely. Remember, if you hit 4 shots with the 180 RPM hand cannon, 1 second has passed. Most of the other guns in the game can kill under that. So if you want to see your enemy deleted from Explosive Shadow, you have to hope they miss and then go for the body yourself. That's 
Too hard to sell for me. Great feeling though. Outbreak Perfected, aka the closest thing we've got to a battle rifle in Destiny 2. Bruh. It's another 450 RPM pulse rifle like Bad Juju, so why is it a whole category higher? Two reasons. Nanites, and the fact that it has zero recoil. Zip. Nada. It is so easy to just pick up and use, and your hardest challenge will be to circumvent its relative lack of lethality. But guess what? Once you get that headshot kill, it produces nanites, and if anyone gets just a touch too close to them, then you're going to have a field day killing them too. I once made a video saying that this gun actively helps you become a better player, in part because you don't need to fight the weapon as much to use it well. I still maintain that, and it's just a wonderful experience to use it. I wish the same was true of Bastion. Just a few months ago, this thing was an absolute scourge of the Crucible. It was everywhere. Sixes, threes, rumble, trials. It was too good that it had to be nerfed, and nerf it they did. Not only does it do less damage per burst, but it has a wider cone angle spread, which means you gotta get closer. Like slug shotgun territory closer. And even then, it feels a bit inconsistent to me. It used to be able to tear down barricades and get a kill on the person behind it, a multi-action capable exotic. Now, you'll be happy if it does one thing at a time well. At least it pairs well with palindrome, hey? Speaking of good pairings with palindrome, Wither Horde wasn't all that bad to use. I'm not someone who has the raw cojones to use it aggressively and get in people's faces, but I've certainly had it done to me whilst making this video. Instead, I tried my best to use it like an area denial tool, making life hard for corner campers and shotgun apes. And there's a lot of success to be had when you look for the opportunities to play this way. It's even useful in 3v3 game modes, but its projectile speed and large visual effects means it's relatively easy to avoid if you're up against one. I'd classify this as a utility exotic first and foremost as a result, which are neither good nor bad. They're tools, and they're only as good as the person wielding them. Cryosthesia 77k was a pleasant surprise. Even on PC, where sidearms are not that great feeling at the time of making this video, I enjoyed the process of testing this one. Cryo belongs to the precision sidearm archetype, which is the hardest hitting out of all of them. Securing kills at range was rather fun to do, and the ability to freeze people as the exotic perk is the cherry on top. That being said, I found myself getting outdueled a lot by other weapons in its range class, and it's fairly unforgiving if you miss a shot. So for dueling reasons, it's just okay. I wish someone would sell me on Borealis. The things going for this weapon are really good. It's an aggressive frame sniper with a good mag size, 45 zoom, and better than average handling for its class. However, the general performance of this weapon is greatly impacted by the relative lack of range, which as of Beyond Light means that the cones are also duly affected. The relationship between range and zoom is a finely tuned one for sniper rifles, and I found that the Borealis performs significantly worse than some of its legendary counterparts. Moreover, the exotic perk it requires you to strip the shield of a guardian inside their super, whilst also matching the element of said super. Good luck getting that to proc, quite honestly. Hard pass for me. But the stat package of the sniper is compelling to some. The best high impact scout in the game right now is Polaris Lance, but even then, I can't really rate it better than okay. It feels and shoots fantastically well. But it's still a scout rifle in a meta defined by hand cannons, pulses, and fusion rifles. The perfect fifth exotic perk adds a satisfying extra dimension to the weapon when you hit four crits, especially in 6v6, but it's not enough to offset the issues that all high impact scouts face right now. I love using it, but the Crucible doesn't have the room to let it shine. And finally, Ruinous Effigy. When you're in the right ranges, this thing absolutely shreds people, and the transmutation spheres are just pure, unbridled fun. Going up to literally dunk on people makes this a hall of famer for memorable exotics. That being said, it's 12 zoom and lower stats across the board compared to other trace rifles, particularly the range and aim assist values, make this the worst feeling trace rifle in its class. You can very clearly feel the steep fall off in consistency when you're outside of its intended range. So overall, this one is just okay. When it works, it works great, but it's not something you can rely on. So far, the weapons featured have been either actively bad, or they've just been lacking something to make it feel good to use for everyday Crucible. Like I said, just because I don't like it or didn't deem it to be particularly good, doesn't mean that it's not great for you. Be mindful of their limitations and work with them. Don't deny the things that hold it back. 
you can turn their weaknesses into strengths by adapting your playstyle or constructing a build to cover for the bad moments. If you've got a build to share with me that makes use of some of these exotics, head on over to the Discord server in the link in the description below, and let me know about it on the Twitch stream too. I'd love to hear from you. These next exotics probably won't need too much getting used to. Introducing the baseline for what an exotic should be in the Crucible, the good. These weapons should be considered lethal and more than capable by anyone who wants to change things up. As ever, quite a few of these require an adjustment period, but I found that, with most of them, the time investment to do so is very well worth the effort. Starting off with Rat King, a very underrated sleeper pick by those in the know. Rat King sports some rather excellent stats to make it a very, very usable sidearm, even for mouse and keyboard. The gun is just begging you to build around its perk that turns you invisible after a kill, which is a mechanic that's super strong right now in the Crucible due to the fact that it takes you off the radar. But even on its own, I found it to be a very solid performer. Not to mention, if you get a couple of mates together all running Rat King, you'll be laughing your way to some very easy wins thanks to Rat Pack's functionality. I'm going to group both Suros Regime and Hardlight together to talk about them. They're both 600 RPM auto rifles that are kinetic and energy respectively, and their base performance is about what you'd expect from a 600 RPM auto rifle. The Suros can change its rate of fire to speed up or slow down, and the Hardlight has very good ricochet kill potential. For the Suros, I love the way Focus Fire ended up performing for me, as I'm normally a pulse rifle main, and this is going to be buffed even further with added range and zoom being thrown in to make it a proper mid to long range dueler. Both weapons perform very well, but they don't blow my mind. Hard Light, unsurprisingly, brings that robust gentleman sausage energy to the table, but quite honestly, I'm not sure why you'd use either over a normal auto rifle. Suros health regeneration is a very handy thing when it procs, but that doesn't happen enough for me to want to use it regularly. So I think this one is probably just a me thing, unfortunately, but I can't deny that they are still very good weapons on their own. You know what I really agreed with though? Izanagi's Burden. There's something about this weapon that's just rather charming. It's a kinetic 90 RPM sniper with inoffensive stats and an S tier exotic perk called Honed Edge, which allows you to consume ammo for a higher powered shot. At 2x, it's not anything to write home about unless you're looking to stick down a super with a headshot. 3x doesn't really do much, to be honest, but at 4x, that's a body shot kill. And the best part is that you only really need one kill to get enough ammo to proc 4x if you have a sniper scavenger on. That all being said, it's not the best feeling exotic. The low handling and the lack of snapshot makes it all feel rather clunky. But if you can get over that, this is a really good surprise option in all forms of PvP. Risk Runner is a weapon that punches up big time. For a 900 RPM non-lightweight SMG, I thought it performed rather well. I certainly didn't think it to be exotic worthy until I got Arc Conductor, its exotic perk, to switch on, and then it became a whole new thing. Given the prevalence of Arc weapons and abilities in the Crucible right now, I found that even without doing the Pulse Grenade at the feet trick, I had serious uptime with the Arc Conductor, which boosts weapon damage and gives me damage resistance to Arc weapons. The chain lightning from just firing the weapon is satisfying as hell and deadly effective with groups of enemies. It's not really a meme option as much as it is a surprising Uno Reverso card to the Arc Dependent. It's strong enough to warrant a permanent slot in my inventory just for those kinds of players. That being said, operationally its range is hit or miss, so it can be risky to really push in and take full advantage of that chain lightning, which, if you get it procced, you absolutely want to do. Lord of Wolves put on a strong show in my testing. This former Plague of the Crucible is still very much alive and kicking, with the three burst pulse shots proving to be wildly effective in close quarters. Being able to apply tracking in your high burst damage in CQC situations is very handy, and it comes with a decent amount of range as well. Release the Wolves, which turns this gun into Armageddon, is an absolute meme, but it still works as a super shutdown if you're well aware of the fact that its range is practically negative. The biggest surprise to me throughout testing wasn't the fact that I would like Yotun, but the fact that it's actually a lot better than people give it credit for, myself included. This absolute unit of a toaster tracks really aggressively, flies through the air quickly, and the blast radius makes it so that it can even be used as a shotgun with the right amount of G-Fuel snorted. This fusion rifle offers a deceptive amount of versatility. 
especially at range where you can essentially time your shot from behind cover, peek out, fire the gun, and the Yotun will do the rest for you. This gun is wildly slept on, and I think for those in the know, this one is a hard one to pass up. Symmetry is one of the best scout rifles in the game, don't even at me bro. The rapid fire archetype makes for some compelling dueling, the sight is superb, the recoil is perfectly vertical, and it's very, very pretty. But the exotic perk is where it gets notched up to 11. Dynamic charge and the arc seeker mode are incredibly strong. To charge it up, you just need precision hits, which really isn't all that hard using a rapid fire scout from distance. When you have built up 7 charges, if you swap to the arc seeker mode, you'll be able to 2 tap comfortably, up close or from distance. Thankfully, it just lasts 7 seconds, but that's only from when you first start firing, meaning that you can time your electric destruction to your heart's content. The only reason it's good and not great is that it's hard to use well consistently on the maps that we have, because it's a scout rifle. To round off the good section, we have Tommy's Matchbook, which is a solar 720rpm auto rifle that hurts you. Shut the enemy down! Yeah, as was the trend with things from 2019, the Tommy's MacBook really does have some thermal issues that can be counterproductive if you're not careful. Whilst it performs similarly to other auto rifles in its class, what sets it apart is two things. The extra damage for when your MacBook Pro overheats, and the fact that it has perfect hipfire accuracy with little to no bloom. It makes for some wonderful gameplay moments when you're within range, and is perfect for those looking for something that gives you the high reward to match its inherent risks. When testing it, I really did feel like Scarface at times, but I found that it's just not for me. As a lifelong Windows user, using the Tommy felt uncomfortable at best and nauseating at worst. As a Crucible player though, its strengths cannot be denied, and I highly recommend using the PowerBook if you're an auto-rifle person. Just don't forget to get the AppleCare checkout. Now, let's move on to the really good stuff the true razor blades of the Crucible that you're going to want to pay attention to if you haven't already. There are 16 exotics in this section. They're all pretty bloody good, and most of you know what they are and what they can do, so I'm going to go through them as concisely as I can if they're a known quantity already. Let's start with Sturm. By now, nobody should be surprised if they get killed by one. Best in class stat package for 120 RPM hand cannon with the catalyst, ridiculous killing potential when used correctly with its sibling weapon Drang, allowing for two taps and one digs. Overall, just a bloody good time in the Crucible. Vigilance Wing isn't wildly strong or overpowered. Hell, its last stand perk doesn't really even work in anything other than 3v3 elimination or survival, and it's great when it does. But what makes Vigilance Wing so bloody good is its ease of use and high damage for a consistent experience. This is a weapon anyone can pick up and slay out with, provided of course that you know the basics of good pulse rifle play. Fantastic weapon for players of all skill levels, and that's why it's great. The best scout in the game is the Mida Multi-Tool. This gun has been in and out of the meta since Destiny 2 began, but it's never been far away from top contention. Boosted movement speed, 100 aim assistance that makes you feel like you can never miss, insane reticule friction, radar when ADSing, and a solid enough time to kill for the ranges that it's meant to be used at. Despite being a scout, its stats, fire rate, and the overall package means that it's just a fantastic dueler, and a genuine movement tool at that. It's a mobile player's dream. Thorn, 140rpm hand cannon. Kill the mans, suck the orb, get the hive juice to kill the mans harder. Two tap potential with soul devourer, really really well balanced weapon. We know the drill. Its conversion from a 150rpm to a 140rpm means that its stat package is a little down compared to other 140rpm exotics, and as a result it doesn't feel as crispy, but it's still wonderfully baked and very lethal. Lumina, same deal as Thorn, but now you're a healer. Kill the mans, suck the orb, light juice to teammates to recover health and boost damage. The best part is that the damage boost applies to you too, so throw on a frozen orbit and body shot kill some fools after you've hashtag blessed your teammates. Criminally underrated weapon that people sleep on just because it has the misfortune of being yet another exotic hand cannon. Monte Carlo, a 600 RPM auto rifle with swashbuckler, but with a different name. This gun is begging for you to build with it. Damage dealt, recharges your melee, and kills up a chance to recharge it fully. Kill with it, and you get a damage boost. Melee someone to death with it, and you'll get a damage boost. The recoil pattern isn't vertical, which takes some getting used to, but aside from that, this is a very good weapon once you get to terms with it. The damage boost and build potential with it is why it's great, and with the patch due soon, I imagine it will be quite a topic of conversation for build crafters. 
Traveler's Chosen is perhaps one of, if not the best sidearm in the game. Its stat package is insane, with vertical recoil and 80 aim assist that gets boosted after you secure a few kills with it. The deceptive amount of range will throw anyone playing short range for a loop, and with Gathering Light restoring your abilities when you long reload, you can effectively stay in the fight for longer if you're someone who's clever about their abilities usage. It's a great slayer, and the exotic functionality rewards those who are bold enough to be aggressive. Fantastic weapon that just might become meta soon with the ability nerfs. I'm going to take a minute here to dish on four very special weapons here, because they don't get the credit they deserve. The four major trace rifles in Aga Scepter, Cold Heart, Prometheus Lens, and Wave Splitter are so good at killing people that I'm genuinely shocked we're not seeing them more often. Like, I understand these weapons came out before we got a full suite of weapon mods for them, but come on now, lads. That's absolutely no excuse to be sleeping on a 0.67 to 0.73 optimal time to kill with a 0.93 body shot time to kill at ranges that make hand cannons suddenly think twice with ammo counts that seem stingy when you spawn in but balloon after a single special ammo brick pickup. If you have never even tried one of these weapons, stop this video right f***ing now and give it a go. You'll kick yourself for not having given yourself the pleasure. Despite the many issues that come with being an energy hand cannon, I have to say that Sunshot is still an incredibly good weapon. You might think that its paltry stats would translate to different on the field behaviour, but in reality I don't find it any harder to use than any other weapon. It's still a great feeling weapon with great explosions and a 150 RPM fire rate. That's kind of it. I don't have anything bad to say or anything worth qualifying. Just don't expect palindrome range and you'll have a great time with this. It slaps. Taraba is criminally slept on as well, if only for the fact that when you proc Ravenous Beast, every game of control suddenly feels like momentum control. Secure two kills with Taraba, which is more than doable, and the lobby is yours for the taking, if only for seven seconds at a time. But my lord, those seven seconds are as good as any Friday night you'll ever have. The gun's base stat package ensures very good on the field behavior, so position yourself correctly and you'll handily get the required energy to rain fire down on the lobby. Hey bow users, I didn't forget, I told you we'd be talking about it soon. Le Monarch is a great exotic. The Thorn-esque bow that deals damage over time is the ultimate lane controller and is a very nasty weapon to face no matter what kind of player you are. Long range, mid range, and even short range with hipfire, a good Monarch user has a potential answer to every kind of player in the Crucible. Fantastic sights, fantastic feel, and an easy to pick up but hard to master curve makes this one of the most satisfying weapons in the Crucible to use. The penultimate exotic for the Great List goes to Devil's Ruin. I'll keep this brief, allow the footage to do the talking here. You could use it like the very good 300 RPM sidearm that it is, but the laser on command after a 1 second charge time really speaks for itself. Even though the charge time is 1 second, the result more than makes up for it. It's a better fusion rifle than most high impact fusions, and it's the perfect pairing for great distance legendaries like the messenger. Finally, the Lord of Lightning, Cloud Strike. Where many scoff at its 140 RPM archetype, the lack of snapshot and 50 zoom, I see a weapon that you absolutely have to call out when you see it in sixes and in threes. The potential to wipe a team is always a possibility with Cloud Strike, and the rest is up to you. Snipers are precision weapons, so to judge it on its base damage would be folly, even if it is mediocre. But play to its strengths, and you're going to feel like Palpatine on ecstasy. Good list so far? Ah, you've probably taken issue with something already, but if you've been pleasantly surprised by what you've seen so far, let me know which exotic you weren't expecting at which position. If you feel like this has been routine so far and you don't really disagree with anything, well, there's one exotic I haven't mentioned yet that might be worth sticking around for, and it belongs to the very best of the best, the Elite. These are the weapons that people cannot stand, the ones they froth over, the ones the YouTubers and the streamers personally lobby to Bungie to overtune them, overpower them, so that we can continue to ruin the game, just like you thought we did. These weapons are the direct result of content creators influencing Bungie and securing a huge bag in the process. So let's talk about them. Elite weapon number one is Crimson. This pulse hand cannon has a lot going for it, even on mouse and keyboard. But when I used it on the sticks, oh my god, 
I can see why you guys get annoyed by it on console. Decent range, great damage, and heals with reloads on a kill? Sure, I miss Red Death too, and this is the closest thing we got to it, so bring it on. But what really gets the gears turning is the fact that if you land that first shot, there's very little the enemy can do about it. Crimson flinches like a motherfucker, which means it's one of the best dueling weapons in the entire game. Elite weapon number two is no surprise, Ace of Spades. Do I really need to explain this? Mm, no, I don't. Hits like a truck, Memento Mori, Firefly, always on radar, high caliber rounds, range for days, only weakness is base handling and reload speed, which changes dramatically once you get that kill. Cool? Cool. Elite weapon number three is my favorite exotic in the game right now. It's Chaperone. Slugs were always strong, but they got a whole lot stronger ever since pallets were nerfed. Chaperone was always king of the slugs, but now? It's gone full Genghis Khan on the short range meta. When you land that headshot, Roadborne activates and gives Chaperone more range than Daniel Day-Lewis. With Roadborne, Chaperone can single-handedly uncover the mysteries of the cosmos and establish a line of healthy communication with North Korea. It is a stupendous weapon, one that I personally hope never gets nerfed, but probably needs one all the same. Elite weapon number four is the closest example to extraterrestrial life on Earth, and we created it. It's the last word. The aim assistance on this thing is dialed up to 11 on controller, but firmly in the negatives on mouse and keyboard. Like I spent a good amount of time on MNK trying to make this thing work, but it's actually genuinely impressive at just how unusable it is. You'd have to be some sort of mechanically gifted wizard to grind out any sort of consistent performance from it. Au contraire, on controller, with my fat fingers and noticeable lack of fine motor control, I was doing fine. More than fine. I was dominating. The gun is practically sentient with how usable it is, even for beginners. Just make sure you're in the right range and boom, the kills just come. For that, and for the fact that it has a 0.53 seconds time to kill, it's firmly in the elite category for me. Elite weapon number 5 is what Vigilance Wing used to be for everyone in year 1, but now updated for modern times. It's no time to explain. On top of being a consistently high damage output weapon, the little black hole buddy that pops up after a few precision hits shoots enemies before you might even be aware of them, and puts in a degree of damage that it actually helps you to kill them much faster than normal. This little buddy often alerts me to players that are on the edges of my immediate field of view, or folks that I've missed whilst fighting others. It's more than useful, and for that, it's elite. Elite weapon number six can't one-shot. It just can't. Never in the history of the g yeah, despite regularly one-shotting people, Hawkmoon is a randomly rolled stat monster. It's great on both controller and MNK, and is a really solid time for the carefully positioned. I find that using this gun like a regular hand cannon is the way to go, and the power causal shots that you can stack up are a side bonus if and when it happens. This weapon is elite for its overall neutral performance and random rolls, but more importantly, it offers you the chance to take up a controlled and measured playstyle to rack up those power causal shots and unleash them to devastating effect. Elite as f Speaking of random rolls, Dead Man's Tail comes in at number 7 here. You can roll all manner of different perks here, but the one that really sets it apart is Vorpal Weapon, because it will allow you to shut down most supers with relative ease from hipfire. Now, I know this weapon isn't great on controller, and that too may change down the line, but it is beyond lethal on MNK. It's a problem. To be able to hipfire with perfect accuracy and gain a damage boost in the process of doing so is incredibly strong. I don't think I need to go on here. DMT is a pretty known quantity at this point. Just don't call it a scout rifle. DMT is not a scout rifle. Pass it on. Of course, you can't really talk about Elite Weapon number 8, Arbalest, without also talking about Elite Weapon number 9, Lorentz Driver. As far as exotic functionality goes, I'd give the Lorentz more kudos than the Arbalest, but the reason they're both here is because they are both linear fusion rifles in a non-power weapon slot. And for both, aiming towards the head turns into more of an aim towards their general vicinity. With a half second charge time and enough range for most maps, you can dome someone before they even know what happened. Their placement in Elite has more to do with the fact that they have overtuned aim assistance than anything to do with the weapon's exotic functionality, but you cannot deny how strong they are right now. Use them like a sniper and you'll have a field day. Coming in at number 10, we have Duality. Chaperone's energy cousin that is Elite simply for its unique functionality, as a slug and a pellet shotgun hybrid. No other shotgun in the game comes this close to the sheer positional utility that this gun provides. Make no mistake, this weapon should absolutely be used as a slug first, 
But in The Crucible, being able to adapt to different situations as they play out is the name of the game here, and Duality comes uniquely equipped to help you handle that. Even if Slug Range gets nerfed, this is an easy recommendation for Elite. At a number 11, we have the plague of the Crucible as we know it. It's the Vex Mythoclast. Primary armor fusion with the damage profile of a high impact auto rifle, but the fire rate of an adaptive pulse. A permanent damage boost when you get kills with it in the form of overcharge. The ability to convert overcharge to linear fusion shots that have the same behavioral characteristics as Arbalest and Lorenz. It's due for a nerf soon, but today it reigns supreme. Possibly the best exotic weapon in the game right now for PvP. Or at least, that's what I thought. And then I tested this one. Do you know why I've saved Divinity for last? Because it's the exotic that took me the most by surprise. In terms of a time to kill argument, Divinity loses badly against his fellow Trace Rifles. The reported value is 1.17 seconds for an optimal time to kill due to its lower damage profile, and you really do feel this compared to the others. But what makes Divinity S tier is because of what it's supposed to do, the exotic perk Judgment. Sustained damage with this weapon envelops the targets in a field that weakens and stuns them. There was no evidence of the stunning part that I saw, but wrapping the target in a bubble makes them ridiculously easy to hit. Not just for myself, but for anyone who's nearby. Their hitboxes are now massive, and any damage they take is going to be amplified. Imagine seeing someone wrapped in a divinity bubble, and you have a sniper on your hands? Hit the bubble anywhere and it'll apply crit damage to them. You don't even need crits to get the bubble going. Just hit them anywhere in the body and track the beam to get the party started. We use this bubble in PvE to boost damage against enemies with small or awkwardly placed hitboxes. So why not use it in PvP? Let me tell you, once you melt someone around a corner through their bubble, you're absolutely going to be intoxicated with how it performs. There's no other exotic right now that can beat just how effective Divinity is. Not a single one. Well, there may be one. Okay, sorry, look, uh, as much as I'd love to honor this meme, this video is supposed to be kind of helpful. And whilst I appreciate the efforts Telesto has gone through to literally become sentient, the reality is that it's just kind of okay these days. Good for a laugh or something different, but not really a spectacular fusion by any stretch of the imagination. Sorry. I'd like to wrap up here by just reminding you that this is just my suggestive rankings. Yes, I did the work and I considered many variables. And yes, I'm well aware that the particularities of my genetics have granted me the vocal cords to demand authority and respect when it comes to great proclamations. But I am but one person, and you are your own self. Do not take this video as any sort of absolute gospel if you find things you disagree with. It's just one person's opinion, and I'm sure you have your favorites and your preferences, and you should absolutely stick to them if you like it. I hope this video was helpful nonetheless, and I thank you for watching it till the end. I'm Ascender Nomad. And I'm your Crucible Doctor. Cheers.